speak. Good morning. It's so wonderful to be back in the sanctuary and see people in person again. So thank you for coming. Um, excuse me if I'm a little nervous. The great poet Maya Angelou wrote, There is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. So this is mine. I was born in Houston and attended First Unitarian Church from infancy through adolescence. Every Sunday I was present at Sunday school. At Sunday school, I remember learning about the lifestyles of the Kung of the Kalahari and the Navajo. Later, in Unitines, my parents eagerly signed me up for human sexuality classes, I guess so they didn't have to give me the talk themselves. <laughs> I also sang in the junior choir and later was an active member of LRY, which was Liberal Religious Youth. We gathered in Channing Hall after services, but had no idea who William Ellery Channing was. The church sponsored the Servetus Club, but we were ignorant of Calvin denouncing Michael Servetus, who was burned at the stake. And the subsequent flight from Geneva to Poland and Transylvania of Giorgio Blondrata and Faustus Socinus, who took their Unitarianism with them. Looking back, there were so many missed opportunities to examine the history of Unitarianism, from Arius of Alexandria to Theophilus Lindsay of London, and finally reaching America's shores in 1782 at King's Chapel in Boston, where James Freeman preached. Although we discussed the symbols of Kung and Navajo divinity in Sunday school, we did never we did not ever discuss the spiritual significance of the Bible, God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit. It was almost as if those words were verboten. This put us at a loss when it came to interacting with our peers and non-Unitarian family members and understanding great works of art, our biblical references in literature. I was well aware of Uranus, Gaia, and Cronus, for my mother read us Greek myths at bedtime. Gaia was most believable, but Cronus, swallowing his children, incredulous. Artemis's child, I love being outdoors, searching for lizards, toads, tadpoles, doodlebugs, and earthworms. I spent many days visiting animals at the zoo and in the piney woods at the Alabama Cushata Reservation. If the Greek gods and goddesses were myths, then the Bible, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit must have been myths too. I had already determined that Santa Claus was not real. Yes, at the tender age of five, I saw my cousin packing Christmas presents into the trunk of the car. On Christmas morning, I saw these exact same presents <laughs> displayed in front of my grandparents' gas fireplace as if Santa had placed them there the, during the night. Ha! Santa Claus was not real like everyone told me, but another myth what to do, create my own secret theology. It required that I keep silent. I could not share these thoughts with anyone. What angst this produced, especially when visiting my grandparents, whom I adored. My parents would take me downtown and put me on the Continental Trailways bus to Dallas by myself. I can't even imagine doing that today. But there was a stewardess on board who kept an eye on me. There would be my grandparents or Aunt Betty Carolyn to pick me up when I arrived and drive us about an hour northeast to Cooper. I spent weeks at their house during the summer. It was truly the safest place I experienced as a child, considering our house in Houston was regularly shot at by the KKK. I was free to walk up to the Cooper Town Square by myself. I learned to garden by my grandmother's side. Papa would take me horseback riding, drive me around the cattle pasture, show me the pecan orchard, and point out geographical features of the land 
giving each one a biblical or a poetic name, like Mount Sinai, the Holy City, the River Jordan, Rattlesnake Island, the Hub. And I learned how to shake, I learned how to shake hands with everyone I met. Mainly, they all turned out to be distant cousins, of course. <laughs> then there were Sundays. My grandparents were devout Methodists and attended church weekly. I presented myself at Sunday school and afterwards sat with them in the sanctuary for services. We had little newsletters which we read aloud. Never having seen or read scripture before, I would overemphasize the pronouns that were capitalized and would receive funny looks from fellow children and the teacher. In the sanctuary, I dutifully sat still, bowed my head at the appropriate times, and listened or dra- listened or daydreamed as the preacher carried forth. I felt like an imposter. One Sunday when the preacher was giving Holy Communion, my grandmother leaned over and whispered for me to go up there that my mother would want me to. What? (laughs) Didn't she know I wasn't a baptized Christian? When I refused and just sat there, I felt I had been found out. Her suspicions must have been confirmed. I was a little Unitarian heathen. (laughs) But thankfully, my grandparents' love never subsided. One summer, I postponed going to my grandparents and went to Girl Scout camp with a good friend and fellow Unitarian. But what a nightmare it turned out to be. Out of the blue, girls started coming up to us and accosted us repeatedly, accosted us repeatedly with, ooh, you don't believe in God, you don't believe in God. How did they know that? I can only imagine that a deceitful camp counselor had initiated that rumor. We were horrified and ready to go home. What they did not know, that I was intrigued by religious books and movies. I was fascinated by Native American culture and read as much as I could find in the school library. Chief Dan George, from Little Big Man, was my guru of sorts. He said, if you talk to the animals, they will talk with you, and you will know each other. If you do not talk to them, you will not know them, and what you do not know, you will fear. What one fears, one destroys. At the doctor's office, I bypassed highlights for children and immediately selected the illustrated children's Bible stories to read. Weekends, I found black and white religious movies to watch starring Victor Mature, And I loved Charlton Heston and Ben-Hur. It wasn't until I discovered Jeffrey Hunter as Jesus in King of Kings that my secret theology was questioned. Gosh, maybe Jesus was real. Miraculously, I found an old Bible in our library at home. I closed the door to my bedroom and started reading. Just then, my father walked in and asked what I was doing. Reading? He advanced toward the bed and took the book to see for himself. His instantaneous derisive laugh told me all I needed to know. Keep my thoughts to myself. Thank goodness for being exposed to Carl Jung by my high school English teacher, and ten years later to Joseph Campbell in the PBS series The Power of Myth. Whether Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, Taoism, Zoroastrianism, and others, They had common spiritual concepts. Although this satisfied me for many years, I still wondered who or what was God. I still couldn't verbalize what I believed in. I soon had an answer. One of the books we read in the book club, The Spinoza Problem, opened my eyes. I will forever be grateful to AJ for selecting that book. In it, Irving Yalom spins fact and fiction into an unforgettable psycho-philosophical drama. He juxtaposes the story of the 17th century thinker Baruch Spinoza, whose work helped usher in the Enlightenment, with the rise and fall of the Nazi ideologue Alfred Rosenberg, who ordered his task force to plunder Spinoza's ancient library in an effort to deal with the Nazi Spinoza problem. Yalom recreates the atmosphere of 17th century Amsterdam beautifully and seamlessly alternates between Golden Age Amsterdam and Nazi Germany. He creates conversations that give a sense of the philosopher's character 
and provide lucid explanations of the man's major ideas about nature, free will, and reason. He weaves the philosophies of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Epicurus into the education of Spinoza as well. This is an excerpt from a conversation between Spinoza and two characters, Jacob and Franco, who question him. Spinoza. Jacob, I must be a poor guide. I thought I had fully explained the impossibility of such things, yet now you're once more into the land of miracles. Again, I remind you, these are all human opinions. They have nothing to do with the laws of nature, and nothing can occur contrary to the fixed laws of nature. Nature which is infinite and external and encompasses all substance, all substance in the universe acts according to orderly laws that cannot be superseded by supernatural means. A decayed body returned to dust cannot be reassembled. Genesis tells us this most clearly. You will eat your bread until you return to the earth from which you were taken, because earth you are and earth to earth you shall return. Does that mean I will never be reunited with my martyred father, asked Franco? Spinoza. I, like you, yearn to see my blessed father again, but the laws of nature are what they are. Franco, I share your longing, and when I was a child, I too believed that all time would come to an end, and someday after death we should be reunited. I with my father and my mother, even though I was so young when she died that I can hardly remember her. And, of course, they would be reunited with their parents, and they with theirs ad infinitum. But now, Spinoza continued in a soft, teacherly voice, I have given up, those childish, I have given up these childish hopes and have replaced them by certain knowledge that I hold my father inside me, his face, his love, his wisdom. And in this manner, I am already united with him. There is no eternal blessedness in the world to come because there is no world to come. Our task, and I believe the Torah teaches us this, is to attain blessedness in the life now by living a life of love and of learning to know God. True piety consists in justice, charity, and love of one's neighbor. Jacob stood and gruffly pushed his chair aside. Enough! I've heard enough heresy for one day. Enough for one lifetime. We're leaving. Let's go, Franco. As Jacob grabbed Franco's hand, Spinoza said, No, not yet. Jacob, there's one remaining important question that to my surprise you have neglected to ask. Jacob let go of Franco's arm and looked warily at Spinoza. What question? I have told you that nature is eternal, infinite, and encompasses all substance. Yes. Jacob's face was furrowed and quizzical. What question? And have I told you not that God is eternal, infinite, and encompasses all substance? Jacob nodded, entirely bewildered. You say that you've been listening. You say you have heard enough. But yet, you have not asked me the most fundamental question. What fundamental question? If God and nature have identical properties, what is the difference between God and nature? All right, said Jacob, I ask you, what is the difference between God and nature? And I give you the answer you already know. There is no difference. God is nature. Nature is God. Both Jacob and Franco stared at Spinoza, and without another word, Jacob yanked Franco to his feet and dragged him into the street. And you regarded him as a wise man. What a fool he is. So who is this Baruch Spinoza. He was born in Amsterdam in 1632 to parents of Portuguese Jewish background. In addition to studying traditional Judaic subjects, he learned Latin and was able to read the classics of the Greco-Roman world. Spinoza had a passion for philosophy and began to raise issues which the Jewish community considered to be heretical. He dared to question the Torah authorship of Moses. He wondered if Adam was really the first man. He asked how people could possibly believe that the law of Moses took precedence over natural law. The Jewish community reacted with rage. In 1656, when he was only 24, 
He was charged with heresy and was excommunicated and denied contact with his own siblings and all other Jews. He lived alone, dedicating his life to philosophical pursuits while making a meager living polishing eyeglass lenses. He wrote down his ideas but did not publish them out of fear of harassment. In 1670, when Tractatus Theologico-Politicus appeared unsigned, it was banned everywhere. In 1674, he completed his major work, Ethics Geomet Geometrically Determined. Uh, I apologize. Ethics Geometrically Demonstrated. He was unable to publish it. In 1677, he died of consumption. His books and letters appeared after his death. Spinoza rejected the dualism of Descartes. He maintained that spiritual and physical elements, God and the universe, are one and the same. This basic principle is the cornerstone of pantheism, the philosophical view that all things share in the divine, pan meaning all, and theos meaning God. For Spinoza, God is not the creator of the universe. God and the universe, God and the universe are synonymous. He says that the will of God is none other than the workings of nature. God is not a personal God. God does not have an intellect or will, does not watch over us, does not know us, and is not a loving parent. God simply is revealed through the laws of nature. God, he says, is perfect, lacks nothing, never changes, and is in fact the totality of everything in existence. To know God means to understand as much as we are capable, the relationship between parts of the world. It means to know our place in the universe. His determinism forces us to welcome everything in life with an accepting mind. We say yes to life as to death. We take the world as it is without complaint. Our goal is to know God. Eureka, at last someone who expressed what I believed all along. I'd finally found some answers to questions that I had my entire life and could now verbalize my thoughts. I must be a Unitarian pantheist. <laughs> Thank you.